In episode five, Mara collapses upon seeing the boy. When she wakes up, the boy is locked up in the same cabinet he came out of, just like on the Prometheus. But she's pissed off at the captain, thinking that he gave the orders. And he explains to her that that boy was thrown off the ship, and now he's back on the ship. That's literally impossible. So they don't know what this boy is, and they're locking him up for the time being. He, however, still wants to find out why her name was on the Prometheus' passenger list. She, though, doesn't get a chance to answer it because the door opens up and it's Tolva, holding a pistol, but she says that she comes in peace. Tolva couldn't take the talk in third class. Franz gives a speech about how they're still in charge, they still should hold course to America, but the question is, what happens when they get there? Because the penalty for mutiny is death. Tolva's mother stands up and says, we're not giving this ship back. If there have to be more casualties, then so be it, but justice is always on the side of the survivors. Meaning, if we gotta kill more people, then, oh well. That just doesn't sit right with Tolva. She knows she needs to switch sides. Tolva was already sick of her mother to begin with. The plan that she had with Crester was to arrive in America and leave them. Take their little sister with them, start their own life. She feels like what her mother and Franz are doing are just wrong. But she doesn't really get a chance to pitch her case, because as soon as she walks in there, she hears the banging from the cabinet, and she wants to know what it is. Mara walks over to let the boy out, and everybody draws their guns at Mara, telling her to stay away from the cabinet. One man in particular has an itchy trigger finger, and he fires his gun at Mara. Daniel dives to protect her, but all of a sudden, time just stops. It's frozen. Mara actually walks over and takes the bullet with her. She then lets the boy out of the cabinet and asks him, Did the pyramid you're holding do this? But just like before, he doesn't say a word. Instead, he grabs her hand and they walk out of there. So when time starts back up again, everybody in the room thinks that Mara just simply disappeared. They're all really confused, but then they start hearing a siren go off. They're a little freaked out because they have no idea what that siren means. And this same goes for the people in third class. They're also freaked out. They don't know what the siren means either. Each side thinks the other one is doing it. There's a little bit of infighting, and Tolva has to get in the way and say, look, you're the captain, what do you want to do? And the captain is freaked out. He admits that he has no idea what's going on, but what he does know is they've been firing the engines at full blast for the past two days. They probably only have two more days of coal left, and they're four days off of land, which means that if they keep going the way that they're going, they're going to end up just drifting off into the ocean. So it is vitally important that they stop the third class group. They need to take the ship back. Then, almost as quickly as it started, the siren stops. But it's replaced by a ticking. And that ticking has a trance-like effect on some of the passengers. People are dropping what they're doing and heading to the top deck. Not stopping for anything. Not listening when their name is called. One of those people is Yuck. Another one is Crester. At first, all of the passengers who aren't in a trance-like state are just very confused. But then they're mortified once they see what the people in the trance-like state do, which is jump overboard to their death. For Crestor's mom and dad, this is especially difficult because having just lost their youngest child, now they're losing their middle child as well. With passengers in a line jumping off the boat, people are pretty scared. Mara is screaming at the little boy, what is happening? What is that ticking sound? But unlike the previous times, this time he actually communicates. He writes down on a piece of paper, they are listening. And then he whispers in her ear, I can't tell you, you have to ask the creator. He then signals to her that they need to go into the shaft under her bed. So they move it, and the boy hops in. Using one of the beetles, it opens up an invisible doorway that was previously unseen. Mara jumps in, climbs through it, follows it, and it leads her to her recurring nightmare. Just like with Yuck, just like with Jerome, just like with the captain, that recurring nightmare is one from her past. She sees the grave that's been haunting her. She sees the mental institution that she's been in before. And she starts walking towards it. Daniel, knowing that he has to get to either Mara or the boy, runs to her room. And when he sees that the shaft is open, he climbs in. He has an idea of where they went. At this point, the door to that portal is closed. But he pulls out that device that looks like a child's toy, moves it around, and suddenly it opens up. It leads him right to the boy. He tells the boy, you shouldn't have done that. It knows we're here now. And the boy tells him, we never got this far. Maybe it'll work this time. Daniel then asks the boy, did you bring her here? And the boy says, yeah. But she didn't remember. 
Daniel gets close to the boy and says, I have to stop this before they sink the ship. We don't have much time. Stay here for a while. He won't find you. Then Daniel goes back through the portal, back to the boat. But Daniel isn't the only one who knows what's going on. One of the crew members sent a distress call to the shipping company. But he gets back the same message that they got when they found the Prometheus. Sink ship. He then waits to give it to Sebastian. But Sebastian went down to the lifeboat exit, and he uses that triangle device to punch in yet another message. When he finally makes his way up to the bridge, he doesn't seem nearly as frazzled as the crew member who got the message to sink ship. He instead pulls out a device, the same device that Daniel has, moves a couple buttons around, and the crew member collapses. So Daniel is definitely not the only one who has an idea of what's going on. The difference is, Daniel's trying to stop it, or at the very least, stop people from jumping overboard. Those that aren't in a translate state have hunkered down, literally tying themselves up to poles so that if this thing is contagious, they don't walk right off the boat. In order to stop it, Daniel heads down to the steam room and starts using that device to control the machine they were told measures steam. He's caught, however, by one of the crew members in the boiler room who has way too many questions and Daniel doesn't have the patience to answer them. As Daniel is trying to fix this thing, the crew member attacks him. Luckily for Daniel, he's able to use that device to immobilize the crew member, just like Sebastian on the bridge. He then continues to go back to work to stop the ticking. All this time, Mara has been stuck in her dream, or her nightmare. She makes her way to the mental hospital, goes upstairs, and she sees a familiar face. It's her dad. He asks her, where did you hide it? but she's in disbelief that any of this is real. She starts asking him, how did I get here? How is any of this possible? Where is Kieran? What have you done with him? He found out what you were doing on these ships, didn't he? And Kieran obviously is her brother. Her dad, though, says, you're not asking the right questions. And then he suddenly disappears. Mara is grabbed by two nurses and injected with something. When she wakes up, she's back on the ship, back in her bed. She knows all that happened, though, because her wrists indicate that she was tied up. She goes searching throughout the ship for somebody, and she's seen by the captain who grabs her and yells, how did you do that? And Mara tells him, it's the boy. It's that black pyramid that he has. I don't know how, but he somehow stopped time with it. The captain then pulls Mara into a room where they could talk privately. She then admits that her name actually isn't Mara Franklin. It's Mara Singleton. Henry Singleton is her father, a.k.a. the guy that bought the ships. She thinks that this must be some kind of experiment because her father dedicated his life to studying human behavior. She tells the captain that her dad was never interested in owning a fleet of ships, so she's positive that he did something to them. She doesn't know how, but she figures that somehow her dad is studying the passengers on board. She then pulls out the letter that she has, and she says, well, that letter you showed me, I got one too. It says Henry because my middle name was Henriette, but that's what my brother called me because he used to make fun of me for being so similar to my father. About four months ago, my brother contacted me and he wanted to meet me at the docks in Southampton. It was very secretive and he said he found out something about our father. I went to go wait for him, but he never showed up. And then I learned that one day earlier, the Prometheus took off. In the middle of the story, though, she notices a green beetle, so she traps it. She moves the bed aside, revealing the trap door, and she goes down the shaft. She tells the captain that somehow this beetle opens up doors. And sure enough, the beetle opens up a secret doorway. Her and the captain travel through it, but this time... They're not in Mora's nightmare, they're in the captain's. He hears his daughter singing, he sees the house, but inside it's all charred up. It's post-fire. The captain's very confused and Mara explains that this landscape is because that shaft was under the captain's bed. If you go into the shaft under Mara's bed, it gives you a different kind of landscape. Each one seems to be fitted to whoever was staying in that room. They return back to the ship and they continue to try to make sense of all of it. The captain asks her, do you think this is some kind of a dream? And Mara says, whatever it is, I think I found out before, but somehow he made me forget. I remember being a doctor at a mental hospital, but he somehow tries to make me believe that I was a patient instead. That passenger list that you found in the Prometheus? Look, I don't remember being on that ship, but what if I was? The captain looks at her and says, that wasn't the only weird thing on that list. He pulls it out and shows Mara that he was listed as the captain. And while he doesn't know how any of it is possible, he thinks he might have been the captain of the Prometheus. Suddenly, the ticking just stops, because down in the steam room, Daniel has been able to shut it off. The survivors celebrate the fact that they're still alive. They then, one by one, make their way to the top deck, where they see that there aren't many of them still alive. 
Virginia, in particular, looks pretty shaken up. She sees the captain and says, it's really good to see you because I just had one of the strangest dreams. The rest of the group seems pretty aware, though, that what they experienced wasn't a dream. The second to last person to come to the top deck is Sebastian, the first mate. He never mentions to the captain at all that he knows what's going on. He just hands him the telegram from the shipping company that says sink ship. And they're all kind of confused on why the company would send the same message. And then Daniel, who was the last person to come to the top deck, says, what if they weren't talking about the Prometheus? Now remember, earlier the first mate sent a message using the arrows. And that message gets received by Mara's father. He gets the telegram back and tells the person that's working for him, tell him he doesn't have much more time. Tell him he needs to bring me the boy. He then gets up, opens a curtain, and he's staring at what appears to be a giant black pyramid. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry. It'll be up in a day or two.